something like lunch break so that you can grab some refreshments down in the lobby. So go there and help yourself. And we will continue with a talk by Rick Wheeler, who's working for Red Hat, who's an architect for the kernel file and storage team. And he's going to continue on the persistent memory. OK, well, uh, good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me. Um, one thing I do like to do is make sure people ask a lot of questions. I don't have, I'm going to talk about some of the things in more detail that Lukash mentioned earlier today, but my metaphors are much worse. So I make it hard to understand. So do, do actually stop me. Uh, again, I've done this talk for different communities, and even other kernel developers don't always understand storage. So don't be embarrassed if you don't ask. So again, we're going to do a brief overview here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, two different kind of technologies that pull us in different directions. And give you a good overview of um, how we get new hardware into the kernel, how we make people, I was telling David and the Anaconda team, how we make your life miserable, give you challenges. Right? Just as soon as you manage to wrestle all the things we've thrown at you into the ground, we come up with new weird things that are like a torment. I, the other thing about shingle drives, um, Lukash gave a great example. A shingle is something on a house roof. It's also a really painful disease. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, you know, one thing to start with, I, I've been doing file systems for a very long time. Way back when I started writing file systems, back in the early 80s, um, we had all kinds of knowledge about storage topology coded into the file system. We knew how fast the drive spun, how long you should wait between writing before you tried to write again because it took that long for the head to be able to write. It took us about 15 years to rip all that crap out of the file system and start again and put it in the block layer where it belonged. Um, but what, we, what hasn't changed is file systems are really general purpose. We can't be tailored just to one application normally or just one type of storage. So we do have competing needs and competing requirements. Um, sometimes we do make special paths through the code, things for databases, for example, who, who manage a lot of the file system like caches and stuff in their own application. But most people here, you know, you want to put your pictures on your laptop, you want your code to go on your laptop. When you turn it back on, if they're not there anymore, you get upset with us, right? So again, that's, you shouldn't care, right? Anybody here use ButterFS? How many people stopped using ButterFS once this year because they lost their data? <laughs> yeah, you know, it should be invisible to most people, except for exotic stuff. So again, you know, we try to make all file systems perform for you. Um, yeah, so again, there, there's also different ranges. Uh, very small systems in your Android handset, they actually run EXT4 without the journal. This is code that Lukash works on and runs in enterprise Linux on very large scale systems as well. Um, so again, there's differences in scale. But jumping to the more fun stuff, this is why I didn't do this diagram. I sat down to do this diagram and I found somebody in Germany who was a much better artist than I was a couple of years ago and I've been stealing his slide ever since. Um, this is why it's hard to make this stuff work really fast. There's actually a ton of code in the file system and storage paths. It's really complicated. And even people who work on storage don't understand file systems. File systems people don't always understand storage. You know, it's a complicated area with a lot of moving pieces. If you look at, uh, is this a, a laser? If you look up here, these guys are the PCI Express, like Fusion IO cards, Micron cards. They decided to cut a hole through the path. They said, you know, you guys are way too slow, way too complicated. Let's make a new path through the kernel. Right? So it's not good to do that because then you have to re-implement some of that same code. So I'm going to talk about going faster. Um, faster is always good, right? You know, unless you're losing your data. Right? Sometimes, uh, you know, we ha I've worked in the past with performance people who come and say, Rick, it's great. The file system is 100 times faster than it was yesterday. Usually that means we've made a mistake and we're not writing it to disk. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's not very popular to tell the performance team, yeah, we're going to make you go slow again. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's better. We also have that between versions of Enterprise Linux. There's things like for NFS where in NFS in RHEL 4 or RHEL 5, we were really fast. It's because if we crashed, you didn't always get your data back, right? And as we make it safer, sometimes it gets slower. But Fast is a difficult thing to do. Um, you know, first of all, you have to figure out what you're measuring. Is it fast in terms of latency? How many IOs per second? How many times you can write to a drive? 
if you're writing to a laptop SATA drive and you're writing new files and actually F-syncing them so they'll be there when you, when you come back after a power outage, you can do about 20 files a second. If you're writing to a Fusion I.O. card, you can probably do half a million files a second. That's a big difference, right? But most people historically realize that storage is really, really, really slow. So most applications try really hard never to talk to us, right? They just ignore us, they keep it all up in DRAM. Occasionally they dump a lot of data to disk and they write big IOs and streaming data. That's the historic pattern that most applications do. And most people don't notice their file system at all, really, right? Applications that do transactions care, and that's actually the new challenge. The new class of devices has made the world change for us in that we have to worry about IOs per second, kind of like the networking people. Anybody here work in networking? Yeah, you guys have, have, have hopefully given us some lessons we've been able to steal, right? So we're gonna try to make the IO stack in the kernel faster. Some of that work started, and we'll mention a little bit about that, about that today. Um, if you think back even five years ago when the first SSD devices came into the market for consumers, at that time, I got asked about five times a week, so Rick, you know, the last you know, two decades of file systems, they're all gone now, right? We're gonna throw them all away because you have a SATA SSD from Intel in my laptop. I don't need your file system anymore. Don't need EXT4, don't need XFS. It actually didn't change a lot for us. It still looked like a block device, right? You know, you wrote a block, it was down, you had to F-sync it, had all the same problem, use a whole stack that we used forever. We had to do a little bit of tuning. You know, you didn't necessarily want to do the same algorithms in the IO scheduling, where we would kind of wait for things as aggressively to kind of coalesce IOs, put a lot of IOs together going down, down to the disk. But overall, we had a pretty easy life. If that was the only change in, in SSD world, we would have been very happy. Once we figured out we could deal with those, industry came out with PCI Express cards. A PCI Express card is basically a big card, looks almost like your video card, full of flash parts, a lot of DRAM. It probably has its own operating system inside. A lot of them do buffering in DRAM on the server. These cards actually go much faster. They can do random reads very fast, just like an SSD, a SATA SSD could, but they can even do random writes pretty well because they do a lot of aggressive buffering. They can do tens of thousands, some of them hundreds of thousands of IOs per second per card. It actually makes life more challenging for us at this point, and they're very, very expensive. I think Lukacs mentioned in his talk earlier today, you have really fat, slow storage. That's a really good deal. Buy a SATA drive, you can put all your movies on it. If you try to do that with a PCI Express card from Micron, Fusion I or anything, you have to have a lot of money, maybe thousands of dollars, but it used to start at like $10,000 for less than, I don't know, it was a couple hundred gigabytes, right? Would be $10,000 card. Very expensive. They've come down in price as they become more common. But when you paid $10,000 for that and you could do say 400,000 IOs per second and we in the kernel community took all the IO latency out and gave you only like 50,000 IOs per second, people got a little, a little annoyed, right? You like to get most of what you pay for. Um, so we have been working on this for a few years. Uh, I think uh, some of the most recent kernels, we've gotten up to millions of IOs per second uh, with multiple cards and a server. So we have gotten better. Again, some of that steal directly from uh, things I, I think Lukash mentioned, the multi-queue uh, block work, so the drivers that opt into that. Took a page from the networking community's book, said you don't want to be queued up on the same block. If the device is really fast, don't wait going down the stack. Send the data down queue up in multiple times and push the data out as fast as you can. So again, these performance limitations are a big, a big focus of work. It's not just a single queue. It's looking at how many times in that very complicated picture we touch the data, how many times we lock, how many times we let context switching happen. A lot of the things in general um, people know about and are working through. So going bigger, this pushes us in the other way. Anybody here have a six terabyte drive? Not yet. They do so. Four terabytes? Somebody's got one, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get them in your laptop, right? But, but they're really common. And if you think about, if you go into a computer center today, you typically have something like 10 plus two drives. You have 12 drives, two of the drives are parity. That's 40 to 60 terabytes in just one rack. 
right? That's a lot of data, right? In RHEL 6, we don't support EXP3 over 16 terabytes. So you'd need a few file systems even to use that data with EXP4. XFS has always been tailored toward larger file systems. And scaling up in size often means using more complicated code, potentially putting more code in the path. Um, you can alloc you can cut you can take a bunch of physical drives with LVM, MD, and make them one bigger device. Change the properties, make them more reliable. We're not going to talk about that. The, the previous talk from uh, uh, on Device Mapper helped a lot with about that stuff already. So why would you want to use a giant file system? Anybody here ever had more data than you can put in one file system? Like you're trying to download. Not that anyone would ever download videos illegally, but Trying to get all your illegal videos or your, your legitimately purposed music onto a little USB stick and it runs out of space. So you have five USB sticks, five file systems. You have to, as a user, administer the allocation. It's really annoying. Now, if you're talking about a server doing large data storage, when you don't let the file system, the kernel, manage your drives, you, we're not managing the head movement for a rotating drive, which means we get much slower. If you put lots of little file systems on a big fat disk, the kernel isn't helping you, right? You, you fight each other. Your applications fight with the allocations and we don't necessarily coalesce that at the file system layer. The IO scheduler layer, which I just told you we try to avoid, it can do it, but again, sometimes we turn it off, right? Uh, sometimes it doesn't matter. SSDs, they're not sensitive to, they, they're not mechanical, they're not moving heads, but in a lot of cases, it is better to go bigger. Um, So here's the stuff that's really new. Uh, again, uh, Lukash mentioned this earlier today. Persistent memory is in some ways not new. Anybody ever program an IBM mainframe back in the 1950s? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just once? Yeah, yeah. So if you go back to core memory, when you, when you had a mainframe and you, your program screwed up or your operating system crashed, if you turned it back on, it started exactly the same place your bug happened before. So whenever you tell somebody who you don't want to deal with, oh, just turn it off and on again, didn't help. All the same junk was in memory as it was when it crashed. Persistent memory kind of goes back to that state at least for the, the parts on the DRAM slot itself. Right? Think of it, it, it looks actually, if you buy them today from vendors, and, I, and we can't talk about specific hardware vendors here, but there are parts you can get today that basically took all the chips from a double DIMM from a DRAM part, scraped them all off, put flash on, have a little super cap or a battery or something, and they sniff the power loss in the bus. When the board loses power, they dump all the DRAM state into the flash. Great. It's really probably going to be much more expensive than DRAM because you took out half the parts, right? You're not writing to flash, you're writing to DRAM parts. Two is it's not going to be very dense. You're going to have less memory, less DRAM in your system if this works. But if you want to use this with things like a device mapper cache target or caching to do software RAID, it's really fast. It might save you money over buying a discrete card um, uh, or, or possibly using software RAID. There are newer technologies coming in the next year that are kind of next generation technologies. And there's a bunch of them out there. MRAM, I don't remember, Tom, what, there throw out other random buzzwords. A bunch, a uh, half dozen, right? People will come out with these parts. Um, they will be here. And those actually aren't the kind of today's technology glued together in interesting ways to give you percent memory. They actually in intrinsically don't lose state when they lose power, right? A lot of how we use them is going to depend on the, the cost of the parts, the speed of the parts, and how big they are. If they're really expensive, like the PCI Express SSDs were, you know, a terabyte cost you $20,000. Banks will buy them, but they won't be in your laptop, right? Not in my laptop, at least. Your laptop? You put $20,000 in your laptop? Yeah, so there's some people who might, but very niche applications. But the price of these parts dictate how, we, um, how, we, how we're going to use them as well, and the size. Um, so again, these parts look a lot like DRAM. They actually fit the ones that we're focused on now. They'll fit in DRAM slots. You can mix them and match them with other kinds of memory. There's actually an industry working group in the Storage Networking Industry Association called SNEA. Uh, has a technical working group, which they call a TWIG, um, 
enough acronyms to get anyone confused. The SNEA twig on non-volatile memory is working on this um, as we speak and came out with a programming model, which is interesting for people to look at because it's not aimed at kernel people, but aimed at applications people. And as Lukas said, we're trying to get the IO out of the path of the kernel. Um, and you know how to use it in an application is really difficult to say. I would say you might have, if it's cheap enough, you might have some systems that'll have only this new class of memory. They won't have any flash devices. They might not even have any spinning disk, like a laptop, a tablet, something like this. But again, it depends on how much power they take and uh, how expensive they are. So this is always the big question. So I said five years ago, everybody said when you got SATA SSDs, do you write, need to write new file systems? So coming back now, now we have this really strange, weird stuff that we haven't had for like 70 years. Um, do we need to write new file systems and IO stacks again today? I actually think we don't. And um, when I talked about this a couple years ago at this SNEA mem members meeting, looking at how we were going to do this in the Linux community, how Oracle and Solaris was going to do this, there was somebody from Microsoft. And we hadn't compared notes, but we all said basically the same thing. It's really hard to get application people to change the APIs they use and the expectations. So if we do succeed in getting the IO, your, all the code out of your IO path, guess what you give up? You give up your backup tools. You give up snapshotting. You give up all this stuff, right? It, we don't touch it anymore. You, you have to do that yourself as an application. Two is the read and write system calls, don't, you wouldn't be using them. You'd be using MMAP and just scribbling on stuff. You'd have to figure out where you put it. So I think, in, in my intuition at least, this is kind of my working assumption, application people will take just about as long to change their model as they have to embrace multi-threading. Out of all the applications in the universe that are multi-threaded, maybe putting Java in its own little special world, um, most are still single-threaded, I think, 20 years after we had SMP. Anybody write applications here? How many application people? How many threads do you have? More than five? Yeah. Yeah. More than just one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty common, right? You know, you, oftentimes you don't need multi-threading. It's complicated. This stuff again, like I said, we've, s we've been so slow for 70 decades. We've taught all you poor applications people, just try to ignore Rick and the storage guys. Just don't talk to them. You'll be faster, right? Keep in DRAM. Don't worry about it. You go faster than you do when you talk to storage. So most applications aren't really I.O. bound. Putting this new stuff in your box is not going to let you browse fire on Firefox or the web any faster. So again, most applications don't care. Some applications, Oracle databases, transactional databases, um, MySQL, anything that's transactional, random read, random write, you will notice a difference. So there are a few applications where the investment to new APIs will be worthwhile. Most software stacks, I think, will stay the same. So this is kind of my big message. You talk to the people who are pushing us towards persistent memory. They're like, oh, cut out all the code from the IO path. You know, make us go fast. That's one message. But like we talked about, you know, we have this new thing. It's called shingle drives. And again, shingle is the, the piece of tar or concrete on your roof, and they lay on top of each other to cover your house. Like I, and I also mentioned it's also a painful disease you can get. These drives have, they're actually in a lot of people's video recorders today. They're not something that might ship. They have shipped in millions of units over the last year or so. Um, we just hide it from you, just like a flash part hides from you with a flash translation layer. There's firmware in the first generation of these parts that hides the nature of the drive from the operating system and from applications. Yeah. Um, it's called shingled magnetic recording. Um, we had a few meetings. Actually, the most interesting one was actually in New Orleans at LinuxCon when all the kind of four major drive vendors who exist in the world came to the Linux community and said, hey, we've got these new drives. This is what the industry standards body wants to do with them. Does it make any sense to Linux? It was really kind of cool to have that conversation with harder vendors instead of hearing two years later that, hey, this is what Microsoft told us to do. Can you do it too? Right? <laughs> So the world has kind of changed. These drives are going to be really popular in big data, in video recording. And by the way, that's all kind of where Linux plays kind of the powerhouse role. I mean, we do dominate in those uh, areas of commerce, 
they came to us, I think first. At least that's what they told me even after a few beers, right? So um, again, this does change the performance and IOP scale to the opposite end of the spectrum. You can do sequential writes in bands of the drives. In other words, write block zero, block one, block two, block three. Every 256 megabytes or so, there's another band. And again, you can write to that sequentially as well, but you can't go backwards, right? You can't write o overwrite. Most file systems today don't work like that. This is almost like a lot of little tapes inside of a, a disk, maybe a thousand tapes. But the difference is you can randomly read from any of them. So the random read performance will be slow. It'll be really dense. Random writes will cause an IO error when you do when you follow the rules, or they'll be handled in firmware and be really slow. So this is the banding. I'll, I'll, these slides will be posted, I think, on the websites later. I'll leave some of these details for you in a good picture. Um, but going to what you have today, um, and the thing that you'll have if you have a video recorder that you bought from somebody or in, in potentially in some laptops, you have drive-managed SMR. Again, that means effectively, just like your SSD, they have a, a translation layer in firmware that hides it from you. You do, if you have really random write workloads, you're gonna have horrendous, horrible, hideous performance. Right? These things are not really general purpose drives today. They're meant to be used for streaming video writing and playback, they'll be fine for that. But you don't wanna run an Oracle database on it. You probably don't wanna run a KVM guest on it. Right? Anything that generates random IO, not gonna be good. Next step up, anybody here have a 4K sector drive? Everybody knows drives do 512 bytes, right? 10 years ago, the drive vendors, vendors came to Linux and Windows and Slayer and said, we're gonna go to 4K sectors. So anybody here know they have one? How many people have a laptop that's newer than two years? You all have them. Every single laptop drive is a 4K sector drive today, pretty much without exception. Most big SATA drives, if you have a four terabyte SATA drive or two terabyte SATA drive with a few platters that are small, also 4K sector drives. What, what they do though is they hide it because it was hard to get operating systems, especially legacy Windows operating systems, even legacy RHEL, um, to support them. They emulate 512 byte sectors. If you're misaligned though, if you actually reliably rely on the 512 bytes and you misalign your file system partition on say sector 63, the traditional, who knows why we picked that number sector that we started on, you'll lose about half your performance for things like virtual machine images and, and databases. So in, in Red Hat, actually the Anaconda team, RHEL 6, we align on sector 2048. Unless the drive advertises uh, a better partition, then we try to take advantage of that. So this is exactly like we do with 4K drives. This drive is somewhere in the middle. It won't disallow random writes, it does add a, additional information to tell you, this is how I'd like you to use me. It fills out SCSI mode pages or SATA pages, saying this is what my real data sector size is, this is what my alignment is, these are all the bands, this is where the head is in the, in the random, a lot of data, thousands of pointers to track, but it doesn't force you to use it. If you do use it, you'll get better performance and more predictable performance. If you don't use it, it'll try its best to work, but if you do a random write, you might be two or three orders of magnitude slower. Instead of five milliseconds, maybe a minute, right? It can be really slow. I mean, it's really bad. So, what if we actually had a drive that made you follow all the rules? This is what's called restricted mode, and this is what a lot of the work is around in the hardest area. This means that if you do any non-sequential write, the device throws back an IO error, your box dies, your file system goes offline, you're done, right? This is something that, it's hard to figure out why you'd wanna do this, right? Hide it in firmware, tell us about it. But the thing is, it's all about reduction of cost. To do the firmware cost money per drive, drives are actually pretty cheap and the drive industry doesn't make a lot of money per drive. So every time they add extra flash or extra DRAM or extra, extra CPU, it costs more. In big, dense storage, 